Good morning to folks on Blackboard. Not Blackboard. Well, you might be on Blackboard, but the people who are on Zoom. All righty. Um, so what I was just saying to the people in person is that I actually got your exams graded. Hooray! Um, so your grades for those are on Blackboard. I actually caught up on everything on Blackboard for all four of my classes last night. So yeah, we're on top of things for today and then there'll be more stuff. Um, so if you're having concerns about your grade, please, please, please email me, make a meeting to come see me uh, or over Zoom. Um, I believe Friday is the last day that you can drop a course without getting an automatic WF. So a WF, if you withdraw from a course after the drop deadline, um, it goes into your GPA like an F. So if you're at all questioning, should I be taking this class? Do I need to drop it? You might wanna kind of ponder that. I think with everything we have left, everyone could hold to passing. Um, but if you are not going to be willing to engage with the work, then you need to be honest with yourself about that and, um, you know, not get yourself an F, we'll put it that way. Uh, but yeah, especially with um, the, uh, Oh, I can't think of words today. The simulation, people generally do very well on that and that can pull up your grade. But again, I want everyone to just go into Blackboard and be honest with yourselves about your level of uh, comfort with your current grade and um, how you feel you can pull it up or not. So um, Again, please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. I'm very glad to meet with folks um, and to help you figure that out. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen for our Zoom folks and share sound because we do have more videos today. All right. Okay, so we had ended with this slide on Friday. Uh, we were talking about essentially, um, move that so I can, there we go, minimize that. Um, we were talking about how you use disputation in REBT. Uh, and so unfortunately I didn't scan these for people who are online. So the next time you come in, you can get the handout. I'll try to hold it up as well. Uh, but for people who are here in person, I do have a handout that I'll kind of walk you through some of the concepts we're going to be talking about over the next few months. All righty. So one of the things that's on this handout um, is an elaborate version of uh, Alice's model. It kind of really shows you how those Bs break down. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. So go ahead and actually yeah, I don't think that's a good way to do it. Sorry for people on Zoom. But essentially, again, you start with that antecedent. And then in response to that, you can either have rational beliefs or irrational beliefs. If you have rational beliefs, you're not going to go down the helpless, hopeless, rigid uh, path. And instead, you will be sort of a fully functioning person. If you do have irrational beliefs, the shoulds, the oughts, then you are going to engage in self-defeating behavior, have self-defeating thoughts, have self-defeating feelings. That's where you will get some of these secondary problems. And then this is where rational motive therapy can come in and help you out. So the next page, the back of that page, is what we call an ABC sheet. 
Uh, and some of you have seen me do these in other classes, but we're going to go ahead and do one now. So this is core from Ellis's therapy um, and has been used in many other types of therapy as well. And the A here is your antecedent or activating event. The B is your belief about that activating event. And the C is the consequence of that event. The example I always use is you see a friend and they don't say hi. So what are some thoughts you could have in response to that? Like first gut reaction, if you saw a friend walking on the path and you're like, hey, and they just don't say anything back. What are some initial thoughts you could have in response to that? What's that? They're mad, They're mad at me, yeah. <laughs> and then how would you feel if you thought they were mad at you? Oh, bad, like worried, bad. Huh? Yeah, worried. I've had some other people say like they get bad back. <laughs> well, how I'm so oh, bad that they're bad, right? <laughs> so that's gonna affect you. What are some other thoughts you could have if they don't respond to you? Yeah, they're having a bad day. So then how would you feel if you had that? Check in on them. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna Check in on them. That's okay, really. Um, you'll be concerned, yeah. Another possibility. Yeah. <laughs> they were so out, right? Like they didn't see me. How would you feel if that if you had that thought? I guess kind of worried. Yeah, maybe worried are they zoned out? Or maybe you'd be like, meh, right? They didn't see me, it's fine. Let's see, we've got one in the chat here. Oh, they hate me. Woo, strong on me. I like it. And Brittany, how would you feel if you thought they hated you? And I'll give you a sec to type. And this one might feel extreme, right? But this is how a lot of people with mental illness might think, right? That's like, it's something wrong with me if so, someone else's actions are due to something wrong with me. Um, and so, you know, people often feel uh, sad, depressed, right? If something like this happens. And those are four good examples. A spiral, thinking what's wrong with them. Oh, I like spiral, yeah. Um, I don't know if any of y'all are still young adult fiction readers, but um, John Green's Turtles All the Way Down uses the spiral metaphor to talk about mental illness quite a bit. And is actually a pretty good representation of OCD in particular because he struggles with OCD. So you would go through these with people and help them realize that like most people think, I saw a friend, they didn't say hi, and then I felt sad, depressed, and I spiraled. And they're missing that the reason they feel that way is because of how they're interpreting their beliefs about that particular situation, right? If you think they hate me, you are going to feel sad, depressed, and you're going to spiral, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> Allie says, yep, that, that feels accurate for her. <laughs> but, you know, you could just feel like maybe worried for them, empathetic for them, if you think about it in a different way, right? And so this is novel to a lot of people. The idea that events don't cause us to feel a certain way. That's our interpretation of events that cause us to feel and act certain ways. And that really is the crux of therapy in this model. The idea is that by recognizing these irrational beliefs, we'll see they're called different things in different modes of this model that we can start to alter how we react to things and that can alter the consequences for us. The next sheet on the handout for those of you in class is just an extended remix of the ABC form where you start to see more of the disputing 
Um, and, you know, you kind of break down the consequences a bit more. And then you'll see E. And E is essentially C again, the consequences, but it's the consequences of your disputation. So, right, let's say your irrational belief is they hate me, right? And the consequence of that is doing that in a precedent spiral. And you do some disputation, you know, like what is actually probably the case. And you realize like, you know, I don't have any evidence to suggest they actually hate me. We just hung out last night and we get along really well. And so then the E is the effects of disputing it. And then you're probably gonna feel a little bit better. So, uh, and then again, for those of you with the handout, if you flip that over, there's an example that's filled in here where in this example, their activating event is I have a meeting about an upcoming in-service. Their irrational beliefs is that the person they're meeting with must not see how poorly prepared I am. I should be in complete control over everything. It would be horrible if Rick rejects me. Their rational beliefs are I want to help. I want to do a good job. These are things we all feel when we're at work, right? So then you talk about the consequences of, you know, if you're having the irrational beliefs, you're going to feel panicky. You're going to procrastinate even more. And so then you dispute it. Why is it catastrophic if others see me unprepared? Don't others have moments where they're unprepared too, right? Uh, why should I be perfect at anything, let alone everything? Um, one of my friends in grad school said this once, and it blew my little mind as a perfectionist. She was like, when you turn something in for peer review, you've got to have at least some mistakes in it so that they have something to talk about. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, sort of an interesting way to look at things, right? Like everybody's going to have something they need feedback on. And then the effects of disputing it, they acknowledge, yeah, it is still unpleasant and inconvenient to be rejected, but I could stand it if that happened. And so they're still concerned, but they have less anxiety and more confidence, and they're going to focus on the task instead of procrastinating further. So that's really important as well. So disputation can not only make you start to think in more rational ways, but it can lead to important behavioral consequences, which is, again, why Ellis said his therapy was always behavioral. Uh, so now I have a video of Ellis working with a patient. But you see, you know now that that may have been the wrong thing to say, but you only know it because you did it. You couldn't have known that before. You really believed that he certainly wasn't going to do a thing like that. So then how do you get over the feelings that you carry around for so many years? By getting rid of the guilt. And guilt means two things, both of which are probably wrong in your case. One is I did the wrong thing, and you didn't do the wrong thing. You argued with him for eight hours or so, and you really were getting very frantic and upset, etc. So there's no evidence you did the wrong thing, and even if you did, you couldn't have predicted it at that time. You're not, not omnipotent, you can't tell in advance. So you're saying, one, I did the wrong thing, which is, as far as I can see, an error, and then two, I'm no good. I must not, should not do that wrong thing, and I'm no good for doing it, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose so, and I also feel guilty because somehow I feel I let him down. Well, but let's suppose the worst, as we do in rational emotive therapy. Let's suppose we could prove that you did the wrong thing and let him down, which I don't think we ever will be able to prove. But let's suppose that that would be a mistake, a serious mistake on your part. But you're a fallible human who makes mistakes. And when you're guilty, you're saying, I must not make a serious mistake. I must not, and I'm no good for doing what I must not do. Isn't that so? I and think that if you put it in those terms, yeah, right. yeah that's, that's how I end the feeling. I, I know. I don't think I initially think of that, but yeah, eventually I turn it inward and... 
I, I, I internalize it as it's all my fault. But uh, certainly he had his problems beforehand, and the mere fact that he threatened to do this showed that he had serious problems. So to say it's all my fault is very, very wrong. Here again, Dr. Ellis is disputing the automatic so that's the part we need to watch. That's the part where he's actually doing the disputation, right? So he is challenging these irrational beliefs, and he's helping Heidegger to realize even if your irrational beliefs are correct, even if the worst possible thing ever happened, could you survive it? Probably, right? But in that moment, we don't feel like we can. And that brings us to our other uh therapists who expanded upon this theory uh to deal with psychopathology and that's aaron timbeck and unfortunately um he died fairly recently so let me update this slide real quick i think it was 2021 so he did live to be a hundred um he was called timbeck by those close to him and in fact one of my professors at grad school referred to him that way for a while, and it took me a while to figure out he was talking about Beck and not just some guy named, like, his full last name was Tim Beck, right? <laughs> and, like, a friend of mine would be like, no, he's just calling him Tim Beck, like, they're buds. I don't think they are, but, um, <laughs> uh, so he developed cognitive therapy and the theory with it, um, and it, he, this also later picked up the B and became cognitive behavioral therapy. Although Beck himself continued to just mostly refer to it as cognitive therapy. He's like, the behavior part is inherent. We don't necessarily need to add it. So he, like most therapists and theorists at this time, started as a psychoanalyst. Oh, interesting thing. Ellis was a PhD. Beck was actually an MD. Beck was a psychiatrist. Um, and he's the only psychiatrist who's ever been a, made a fellow of the American Psychological Association because he's contributed so much uh, to therapy. But yeah, he started as a psychoanalyst and the American Psychoanalytic Institute rejected his membership application on the grounds that his mere desire to conduct scientific studies signaled that he'd been improperly analyzed. And apparently that decision made him angry the rest of his life. <laughs> Understandably, like it's a little silly to be like, yeah, we don't want you to do any research. That means there's something wrong with you, right? So he actually kind of came up with his ideas, particularly he started by treating depression because he was a psychoanalyst. And so he was doing dream interpretations. And he realized in the dreams of his depressed patients, they were often talking about things that meant they were, you know, like down on themselves, you know, guilt, shame, I'm a horrible person in their dreams. And so then he started talking about the, these type of themes with them outside of their dreams and realized, yeah, they feel that way in real life too. And so he realized like, there's something to this that is maintaining depression in these folks. So Beck really wanted to look at cognitions and how they contributed to psychopathology. He thought that cognitions caused one to become depressed, but also kept you depressed. He developed his theory independently from Ellis around the same time, but then later on acknowledged that some of his later works were very influenced by Ellis's. So there's a lot of similarities. Oh, and one thing I should say real quick as a side note is that Beck and cognitive therapy are much more popular, much more used um, than Ellis and rational emotive therapy. And I honestly think the big difference for that is Beck did a lot of research, wrote a lot of research articles, also had this training center that his daughter still carries on. Um, whereas Ellis was writing popular press and you know, really more of a clinician. And so Beck is more influential because he was writing for the people who train the next generation. Um, I think if Ellis had done more of that, his therapy would be just as influential. 
All right, so now we have a, a video of him talking about cognitive. Yeah. Using this cognitive map, they're able to then use a variety of techniques. They could be experiential, they could be uh, insightful, they could be strictly cognitive or behavioral uh, to attack the disorder. For example, at Oxford, there have been about 10 or 12 different disorders that have been tackled, social anxiety, chronic fatigue syndrome, hypochondriasis, panic, and so on. Each of these disorders has its own cognitive constellation. And once the cognitive constellation is pinned down, then one can get the various important techniques that are going to be useful in that. And the approach can be quite different, judging from one to another. For example, in panic disorder, our basic assumption is that people who have a panic disorder are misinterpreting various internal sensations. Now, when the patient comes into the office, the panicky patient is fairly calm. For one thing, panicky people feel much more reassured when they're in the presence of an authority, of a medical or psychological authority. So they will never feel panicky in your office. So what we have to do is we have to produce a panic attack or a semi-panic attack, get the patient then to become aware of the sensations. And at that point, when they're aware of these sensations, they can then relabel them as not a threatening disaster, not a catastrophic thing, but is something that's quite explainable in normal biological terms. But since they're in a very high affective state, the sluices for learning have been opened up and they can then take the information in and within a very short period of time they have reconstructed their entire interpretation of internal sensations. Now in contrast... So real quick, this obviously is showing one of the ways this therapy is inherently behavioral, right? Um, and you might be like, how do you induce a panic attack? Well, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can have a patient run up and down the steps to just get their heart rate up. Uh, you can have them spin around in an office chair. You can have them breathe through a drinking straw. Um, and again, this is not to torture your patient. But it's to give them the sensations of panic in a safe space where you can help them learn to de-escalate the panic and understand what's going on. Panic disorder is an overreaction to the fight or flight reflex and particularly to our own internal sensations. So when we are in fight or flight, things happen like our heart rate speeds up, we breathe more quickly, um, we might feel nauseous because blood flow stops to digestion because we can do that later. We might feel lightheaded because blood flow is diverted more to the limbs to help us run away or fight back. Um, and all of these are what happens to people when they're having a panic attack. But if you don't know that, you feel like you're dying and going crazy, right, when you have a panic attack. So by inducing it in session, you're able to explain that to them. You're able to give them breathing and relaxation techniques to de-escalate it so that when it happens in the real world, they know how to fix it. Somebody who's depressed doesn't have to have the depression reproduced in the office because they already are depressed. And so what one does there is to see the kind of thinking, but in the thinking of the depression is not focused on internal sensations as it is with a panic, but has to do with their own beliefs about themselves, about their future, and about their past. And so one can deal directly with the way they're interpreting their external events at that time. And so that becomes a big part of everything. And I, yeah, I have another video, so I'm just gonna leave the lights off for a minute here. Um, and then, so the person who is really going to keep sort of carrying on uh, Beck's life work and you know has been doing so for years is his daughter, Judith Beck or Judy. Um, and so very similar to Freud and Anna Freud, Judy has, um, I, you know, been very much trained in Steve. She actually started as an educator. Um, the video we're gonna watch, she talks about that a little bit, uh, but this just intrigues her and she became really interested in it. And so um, she founded the Beck Institute in Philadelphia, which does clinical work research, but honestly is mostly focused on training the next generation. And so pretty much until his death, Beck would still come in and give trainings to people. Uh, he would be wheelchair bound. Her therapy book right here uh, was essentially 
my recipe book when I first started doing cognitive therapy. It is so clearly explained, so well laid out. Um, it just made therapy so much more approachable as a therapist. Uh, and then uh, I've actually taken a workshop with her when she came out with this uh, book, The Beck Diet Solution, which she even hates the name of. But it's essentially about making behavioral changes um, and using cognitive therapy to help you make them for health. Um, but the publisher wanted a catchy title. But again, really interesting, really uh, helpful. I, I think, unfortunately, some of this has been appropriated in not great ways for things like Noom. Um, so I think Noom was a great idea in principle. Let's take psychology and apply it to healthy eating. But unfortunately, it's been warped. And now sometimes, uh, apparently, Noom will tell you to eat like the amount of calories that would only sustain a toddler instead of an adult. So, you know, just be cautious of anything that explicitly says it's not a diet, but then talks about food. Just gonna put that out there as an eating disorder researcher. Um, <laughs> but she is, I've also seen her do um, live role plays of therapy, and she is just a really great model of how to do this therapy. So we have a video of her talking about therapy. And I think she also talks about my, the organization that I belong to, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. I didn't start off in the field of psychology. I actually started in education. And it wasn't anything about not wanting to follow in my father's footsteps. I had always just wanted to be a teacher ever since I was about five years old. As an undergrad, I studied education, and then I got a master's degree in educational psychology, and then uh, a couple of years after that started a doctoral program, mostly in education at first, but then I got more and more interested in psychology and became a cognitive therapist. And now I've really kind of come full circle because most of what I do now is teaching, either through writing books, um, giving workshops and presentations throughout the world, teaching the psychiatric residents at Penn, um, writing and then teaching our online courses and a number of other activities that all have to do with education. And then a couple of years later, he was given a big award in Philadelphia. She's talking and about her the father. The person who introduced him recited all of his many accomplishments, very few of which I had known about. So it's interesting that I didn't know that my father was a big deal until I was already in the field of education. And of course, once I really started to study cognitive therapy, then I began to see how important he was to the field. I think my major contribution has been in educating others about CBT. So I wrote the basic textbook in the field, Cognitive Behavior Therapy Basics and Beyond, which has been translated into over 20 languages, and its sequel, Cognitive Therapy for Challenging Problems. I spend a fair amount of time on the road each year, giving workshops and other presentations, both nationally and internationally. In 1994, I co-founded the Beck Institute with my dad, and although we were originally primarily clinical, the dream had always been to make Beck Institute into a training organization. And I think we've really fulfilled that mission. And my contributions have been in developing our workshop programs that we give on-site and also off-site, in developing the training for organizations that we do. Large organizations come to us to help them either um, initiate or improve their CBT programs, and we do training and supervision of therapists. We also have a supervision and a consultation program. And finally, in the last couple of years, I've been spending most of my time and efforts on developing online courses. So I think my major contribution has been in teaching others and disseminating CBT worldwide. So how can we disseminate CBT more effectively throughout the world? Well, I think there are a number of ways. One is through online courses, such as the ones that we've recently developed that can really reach all of the different parts of the world. A second is, I think when we're teaching CBT, it's going to be very important for us not to, to teach it to people in a manualized way. You know, treatment manuals were written so that there would be fidelity and consistency in research trials, and the principles in um, the various manuals are very important to learn. But really an overriding concern, I think, is teaching clinicians how to conceptualize the individual patient 
and then plan treatment based on this conceptualization, informed by the principles and treatment manuals. I just have to like stop and say that like this speaks to my clinician heart. I don't see patients anymore, but this was always sort of my philosophy is that so some people within the CBT realm and just like the therapy realm in general think like you should take a manual as written for therapy, only do what's in there. And if your client's having other problems, oh, well. Um, but luckily, my grad advisor was of this mind, too. She was also my eating disorder client supervisor. And it was like, no, we need to adapt it. We need to make sure it's working for our clients and making sense. And um, I love that this is a big part of what she does now. So I think we can also use social media, and as technology improves, I think we'll be able to do more and more in educating therapists throughout the world. What I'd like to see in graduate training programs in all mental health fields is a reliance on evidence-based treatment. There are still so many programs that teach psychotherapeutic modalities that actually have very little research base, and each year, the evidence base for psychotherapies like CBT is just getting stronger and stronger. I'd like to see that it's taught and that it's taught really well in graduate programs and that people who are supervising the trainees are certified as competent supervisors in CBT in order to do that. One of the big problems in some programs... So again, this is something that like in my opinion, shouldn't be controversial in the field, but is. <laughs> um, so within CBT and other types of therapy, like uh, interpersonal therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and this is really one of Beck's major contributions, you do a lot of research to make sure it works. Essentially, you're trying to make sure this is going to help the patients not harm them, right? There are still a lot of programs that are like, screw that, we're just gonna teach you to do whatever and like hope for the best. Um, and I think they're again well-intentioned that like in their mind, they're like, sure, psychoanalysis works as well, even though the studies don't show that. But again, just a reminder, her dad was rejected from a psychoanalytic society for wanting to do research, right? So to me, some people reject this, that it's like, oh, you're making it too formulaic, blah, 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 blah. For me, it's like being an ethical psychologist is using things that are going to work, right? Programs, it happens perhaps in psychiatry more than psychology, I'm not sure, is that students do some book learning about CBT, but then they have supervisors who really are trained in a whole different modality, and they end up getting very little, if any, supervised practice in CBT. So that's something I think that really needs to be changed. And my program, I was very lucky that we were, we did have uh, professors who were very well trained in CBT, stayed on top of all of the evidence-based treatments and could both teach and supervise us on them. I think that cognitive therapy has evolved greatly in the last 50 years and will continue to evolve in the future. One of the things that I've seen happening in the last few years, which I find very exciting and I think will continue, is adapting techniques from other psychotherapeutic modalities within the context of the cognitive model. So CBT now, when appropriate, may incorporate techniques from compassion-based psychotherapy, from acceptance and commitment therapy, from dialectical behavior therapy, from psychodynamic psychotherapy, from supportive psychotherapy, from interpersonal therapy, uh, from motivational interviewing, and I could go on and on and on. But I think having a variety of techniques from which to choose makes therapy much richer and much more effective. Another way that I think CBT will continue to improve in the future is by improving the treatment for clients who now do not have a full recovery from their disorder. So there are a certain number of clients for whom CBT doesn't help. And this depends on the disorder. So I know traditional CBT for bulimia, for example, only 60% of clients would have a true recovery. So that meant 40% did not. Um, the, they, it has been improved with recent tweaks, but this is a really important point that like, just because it works for 60% of the people, we can't be like, woohoo, it's great, right? Yeah, it's great, but we can make it better. Or who have only a partial response. And I think if we put a spotlight on that population, that we'll be able to 
figure out how we need to adapt CBT to be more effective. And one of the interesting things, and I think this video was made before she herself did this, um, one of the interesting things that she had done in recent years is when she revised the cognitive therapy basics and beyond, uh, what they brought in was stuff from positive psychology and humanistic psychology. Um, so it used to be all of your check-ins and CBT were related to like, how is the disorder doing? And now what they do is they focus as well on like, what went well this week? You know, what has been working? And doing so gives the patients more hope and helps with their progress. So I thought that was really interesting that she was willing to kind of like redesign that. And that partially came from her father's work. Um, her father kept researching well into his 90s. And in late in his life, he expanded CBT to help people with schizophrenia. So challenging the delusions as if they were these irrational thoughts. Um, and from that work, he realized we need this positive psychology aspect to things. Um, and so that really inspired her. You're 94. I wonder what kind of life wisdom you have for the group. Julie, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to show this clip just because you see his life wisdom, but also you can see again, this was when he was 94. He was wheelchair bound, but he was still like sharp as a tack. Um, I think around this time I saw him speak at APA, still had his wit. And then a couple other times I went to APA, he zoomed in and again, still very sharp, still very with it, pretty much to the end of his life. <laughs> See how well I knew my dad? Um, I, know that this is, I, I think if one of the points of cognitive therapy is to be humanistic and optimistic and to like other people, connect with other people, but also be optimistic in your own life. And if you are, you're going to have a much happier life than otherwise. So that's what I would say is the secret. So. And if people are not necessarily born um, with an optimistic bent, is optimism something you think that can be learned? Yeah, and you can, uh, you can learn optimism by deciding that you're going to look at the positive side of things. Because many things in life, perhaps most things, have either a positive or a negative. And you can look at the negative, or you can focus on the positive element. And I, I, I noticed that in myself, no matter what happens, it seems I always make a virtue of it. Like if I want to go outside and get a lot of sunshine, and it starts to rain, and I think, oh, that's great. Now I can go indoors and work on a paper. Or um, if, if somebody- uh, Again, the man was 94 at this point. I can go indoors and work on a paper. He like, didn't understand what retirement was. <laughs> uh, doesn't answer a phone call. Then I think, well, that's good because probably he or she is too busy. And that's, that's a good reason for them not. So I try to make a virtue of adversity even when other people might consider this adverse. So it's one way. You know, and, and I've seen And so we'll end of that video there, but I just thought it was great to get some life wisdom for such a big name in our field. Um, definitely is inspiration. Uh, and they did a beautiful, like, virtual celebration of life ceremony for him after he passed as well. And one of the things I really loved that they did at that as they asked those of us who are attending to like fill out a poll and say what we were going to do in his memory, which was really cool. Um, and so like I had just started, like signed up for training uh, to, I work with a national organization as a digital counselor. And so I put that in, you know. So um, in cognitive therapy, what Ellis called rational and irrational beliefs, uh, that called cognitive distortions. So you think or see things differently um, than perhaps is accurate. It's a nice way to put um, that you're just not seeing things the way that they actually are. And so a big thing that Beck talked about was schemas. He said people have illogical ways of processing information. 
And psychopathology was a logical outcome of these illogical beliefs, right? So if every time you walk down the street, you think everybody's mad at me, it's perfectly natural to be anxious all the time, right? Because other people being mad at you is not a good feeling, right? And that these are sometimes called core beliefs as well, because they really get to the core of what is at the center of your psychopathology and how you uh, perceive yourself. Automatic thoughts are these negative thoughts that pop into our head in certain situations. And oftentimes we don't even realize we're having them. We don't control them. They're just always sort of beating us down. And he talked about the negative cognitive triad, thinking about a negative view. And he talked about this in one of the videos of the future of yourself and of the world. As I mentioned, it's always been behavioral. In fact, his original therapy for depression, which he called cognitive therapy, had all it's, the whole first unit was behavioral, borrowed from, I believe, Mike, Mike and Bob's uh, behavioral therapy for depression. So you do thought experiments. So if someone says they're unlovable, you have them think about others that might actually love them. Or if they say they can only be happy in a relationship, ask them to think about a time they were happy. And it might be a time when they were not in a relationship, right? Uh, and so this is the same thing as disputation in RET. Behavioral activation is that component that he borrowed incorporated from another therapy into his cognitive therapy for depression. So a lot of the times people who are depressed, part of what perpetuates the depression is that the fatigue, the lack of energy, the anhedonia, the not wanting to do things they enjoy, will just keep them in the house, not doing anything. And so when you're not having the experience of things that bring you joy, it's hard to experience joy, right? And so uh, you would actually schedule activities for them. You start usually by just having them document what they're doing for a week. Um, sometimes that's really eye-opening for them. Like, I didn't realize I was spending six hours a day just sitting on my couch, right? Um, and then you have, the, okay, what would bring you joy? What's something that's low stakes that you can do? You know, and for them, it might be, I really like art. So I'm going to go to the Chrysler Museum one afternoon this week. It's free right? I don't have to interact with people if I don't want to, <laughs> things along those lines. And Beck found that by just getting them out and doing things, depressed patients started to feel better. And this goes back to, again, Adler's idea of acting as if. This is telling people, fake it till you make it. Go out and act as if you're not depressed, you're not anxious, things along those lines. The object is to get them trying it and to overcome these cognitions that are getting in the way of their progress. So a big part of what you do in cognitive therapy is identifying and challenging automatic thoughts. So if you go to your handouts, the next page is called a daily thought record. And if you look at it, you'll see it's just an expanded remix of the ABC sheet. <laughs> so we they call it the situation. That would be our A, our activating events, right? Then they say automatic thoughts, those are our beliefs. They're specifically focusing on emotions and consequences. And then you've got your disputation, your rational response, right? Rational responses to each automatic thought. And then you've got your E, your outcome of the disputation. And what I really like about this version of the thought record is that at the bottom, it has some of these questions that help with disputation. What is the evidence that that automatic thought is true? What's the evidence that it's not true? Is there an alternative explanation? What's the worst that could happen? Could you survive it? What's the best thing that could happen? What's the most realistic outcome? Um, and then my favorite is number five on the bottom, or sorry, number six on the bottom of that sheet was if one of my friends was in this situation and had this thought, what would I tell him or her? We're often much kinder to our friends than we are to ourselves, right? So that can help us kind of step out of our own self 
uh, and to realize I'm not being very kind to myself at all. And then you want to eventually get down to identifying those core beliefs that are driving these negative automatic thoughts and challenge those. And that could be really scary for people. Oh, good question, Brittany. Does actually, as if actually work? Sometimes it makes me 10 times more tired and sad. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, you know, sometimes it works in the moment and it doesn't later. And sometimes you have to figure out the ways that acting as if works for you, right? So obviously, like, if you're acting as if you're not scared of snakes, this is a silly extreme example, and you go up and just pick up a, I don't know, a cobra and it spits in your face, right? That's not going to go well. Same thing with depression. If you are trying to act as if you're not depressed and go immediately to like, I've got to act happy, shiny, that's not going to work, right? Or I've got to do 10 things. That's not going to work. But you start with the little things and that can help. Yeah, that's a really good question, Brittany. So. Um, schemata or schemas are uh, examples of what he looked for in depression and other disorders. Um, there are some examples of them on the back of that sheet. Um, so non-dimensional and global, just like I am fearful. It is, I can't do anything about that. Not to be able to change that, I'm stuck absolutistic and moralistic. I'm a despicable coward. Can't change that. I'm judging myself. Invariant, I have always been and I will always be a coward. You can change that. Uh, I have a defect in my character. This character diagnosis is a really common one for people in general, but particularly people with uh, psychopathology. And then irreversibility. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm stuck with this. So Judy uh, took that and expanded it to core beliefs. And she sees them in two main categories. Thoughts about feeling helpless and thoughts about feeling unlovable. And you can have core beliefs in both areas. But the idea in cognitive therapy is to really get down to and challenge a couple of these. Um, and I had patients like blatantly say, I'm unlovable. It's horrible to hear someone say that, right? But they truly, truly believe that, unfortunately. I'm defective, so others will not love me, right? I am weak. I am vulnerable. I'm inadequate. Um, and so when you start to challenge these, and this is hard, and this is a weeks-long process when you do this with clients, it can make a huge difference. One of my clients that we got down to the core beliefs I could not believe how radically she changed. She was someone who was ultra perfectionistic. Everything was about achievement. And at the end of our time together, she chose a job that had less prestige because it's what she wanted to do. Um, she never would have done that before we worked through things. So we have just a couple more slides that we'll go over on Wednesday before we do our discussion. Um, so I have altered the readings I used to have some long ones. I've made a bunch of short ones instead, uh, just so you get a better feel for the wide range of uh, approaches within this model. So I will see y'all on Wednesday. You want to hang out with us? In my couple of minutes, I am. <laughs> Hmm.